Hi everyone, my name is Sophie Lowe and I'm the Director of Visitor Services and Program Management at the Museum at Eldridge Street. Our program tonight is captioned, so if you would like to turn on that feature, there is a box at the bottom of the Zoom screen which you can click on. It's powered by AI, so I apologize in advance for any typos that might occur. I also want to thank you for joining us for today's program. We have a lot of newcomers today, so I wanted to briefly introduce who we are. The museum at Eldridge Street is housed in the Eldridge Street Synagogue, a national historic landmark that has been meticulously restored. It was opened in 1887, and the synagogue is the first great house of worship built in America by Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe. Today, it's the only remaining marker of the great wave of Jewish migration to the Lower East Side that is open to a broad public who wish to visit Jewish New York. Our exhibitions, um, our museum offers exhibitions, tours, cultural events, and educational programs, which often tell the story of Jewish immigrant life. We also explore architecture and historic preservation. And if you come to visit us today, which I hope you will, you'll notice that we are in the middle of Chinatown. And one of the things that we treasure is facilitating stories from the diverse communities in and around our neighborhood. And one of our most popular events is our signature egg rolls, egg creams, and empanadas street festival, which will be held virtually this year. Our museum has now been closed for a year, but we are excited to be announcing our reopening soon. So please keep an eye out on our website and social media for that announcement. We feel truly honored to be the recipient of the NEA Big Read grant. NEA Big Read is a program of the National Endowment for the Arts designed to broaden our understanding of our world, our communities, and ourselves through the joy of sharing a good book. The museum at Eldridge Street is one of 78 not-for-profit organizations to receive a grant to host an NEA Big Read project between September 2019 and June 2020. NEA Big Read is a program of the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with Arts Midwest, and we thank them for their generous support. We also wanna thank our wonderful partners, China Institute, Chatham Square Library, and the Museum of the Moving Image for co-presenting some of our other upcoming programs with us. Now, I want to introduce our phenomenal speakers who will be discussing the acclaimed novel, To Live, or Huo Zhe by Yu Hua. We are so fortunate to have Dr. Michael Berry oversee this project and bring forth so many phenomenal speakers. And just a reminder, in case you didn't see, there are three more programs to this series. This upcoming Wednesday, March 10th, we have a bilingual book reading co-presented with Chatham Square Library with Professor Berry and Professor Mingwei Song. Uh, they will be speaking both in English and in Mandarin Chinese. Then the following week on Monday, March 16th, our conversation tonight will continue with Professor Barry and Professor David Wong, and that will be co-hosted by China Institute. And finally, on Thursday, March 18th, the Museum of the Moving Image will be co-hosting a discussion with Professor Barry and Professor Xu Chuang Detman about Zhang Yimuo's uh, film adaptation of To Live. The museum will send a link to registrants to access a screening of the film for you as well to watch in advance of the talk. So if you haven't registered for those programs yet, you can do so on our website. And if you didn't already know and you're local to New York City, you can enrich in this programmatic experience with us by borrowing the ebook of To Live in English or a physical copy of the book in both English and Chinese from the New York Public Library. Professor Michael Berry is, uh, is a professor of contemporary Chinese cultural studies, and he's the director of the Center for Chinese Studies at UCLA. He is the author of numerous books on Chinese cinema and culture, including Speaking in Images, Interviews with Contemporary Chinese Filmmakers, and A History of Pain, Trauma in Modern Chinese Literature and Film. He has served as a film consultant and a juror for numerous film festivals, including The Golden Horse in Taiwan and Fresh Wave in Hong Kong. He's also the translator of several books by contemporary Chinese writers, including Wild Kids, Nanjing 1937, A Love Story, 
the song of everlasting sorrow, remains of life, and Wuhan diary. He also happens to be the translator of the book we will be discussing this evening, To Live. Professor David Wong holds a joint appointment in the Department of East Asian Languages and Civilization and the Department of Comparative Literature at Harvard University. He is director of the CCK Foundation, Inter-University Center for Sinological Studies and Academician, Academia Sinica. His research interests include modern and contemporary Chinese literature, late Qing fiction and drama, comparative literature, theory, colonial and modern Taiwanese fiction, and Asian American and diasporic literature, plus into, uh, Chinese intellectuals and artists in the mid 20th century. Wang's recent publications include Taiwan under Japanese colonial rule, globalizing Chinese literature, the lyrical and epic time, modern Chinese intellectuals and artists through the 1949 crisis, and Why Fiction Matters in Contemporary China. He is editor of Harvard New Literary History of Modern China. After the program, if you have any questions, please enter them in the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we will get to as many questions as we can. Professors Barry and Wang, I invite you to turn on your camera and unmute yourselves, and uh, please take it away. Thank you, Sophie. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate your introduction and we appreciate the support of the museum at Eldridge Street and the Big Read program. It's, uh, and it's for me a personally such a great honor to be reunited with Professor David Wong, who actually was my doctoral advisor back in graduate school. And, and, and I was just thinking about this when I first applied for graduate school all oh, many, many years ago, some 25 years ago, I sent him my English translation of To Live as part of my application package. And so uh, now 25 years later, it feels like we're full circle. So David, welcome. It's such a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, certainly, uh, you just brought back the found memory that, uh, yes, I, um, I, I read your translation of To Live. I was so impressed by, by your handling of uh, the novel in English that I really wanted to, uh, to work with you. And now 25 years uh, have passed and now you are a very established scholar uh, in your own right. So it's really a very pleasant occasion for me to be uh, together with you talking about the novel. Well, thank you for, again, for taking time. I know it's early in Taipei to join us. And for our viewers, this is the first of two dialogues that Professor Wong and I will be having about the, about the novel. And we decided to structure them in such a way that today it would be a bit more of me asking David questions to set the stage on modern Chinese literary history, to kind of uh, contextualize some things. Then we'll eventually segue over to the author, Yuhua, give some background about Yuhua and the novel. And for our second dialogue, we'll talk more about the translation and issues of trauma and historical memory. But for today, I wanted to begin by kind of circling around Professor Wong's most recent book, uh, which is entitled Why Fiction Matters in Contemporary China. And although it's not a book about Yuhua, it, the themes of that book very much pertain to Yuhua and to his generation of writers. And I thought it would be good to kind of set the stage by beginning there. But before we get to that book, I wanted to, I don't get many chances to do this. I wanted to ask David a, a personal question about we're gonna be talking a lot about narratives, fiction and storytelling in modern China. And you're someone who has devoted your entire career to the study of Chinese fiction, to promoting Chinese writers, not just as a scholar, but Professor Wang is also the editor of multiple book series which have introduced some of the most important voices in contemporary Chinese fiction to the world. And I'm curious, when did your love for Chinese storytelling begin? What were the stories novels, dramas, films, and when you were a young man or in your formative years, what were those stories that drew you in and kind of led you down this path to take a career in researching Chinese fiction? Well, I actually, I, I started to take interest in narrative fiction, um, at least in the Chinese tradition, I think as early as my uh, childhood years. Um, at that time, of course, I, 
primarily was drawn to uh, traditional Chinese um, uh, narratives, um, uh, full lengths, um, fictional cycles, uh, the, uh, the monkey, the dream of red chamber and so on and so forth. So for me, it was a very, very natural thing to, um, to take up the path of uh, uh, working on, on narrative fiction when I um, decided to become a literature specialist. So um, yeah, just, um, just, just that um, spontaneous or natural, if you will, um, just to, uh, to be interested in the, uh, the narrative um, side of, um, the, of uh, Chinese tradition. Great, thank you. And your, your most recent book published by uh, Brandeis University Press, Why Fiction Matters in Contemporary China. I'm wondering if you, maybe you can break down, maybe introduce the book a little bit to us and, and maybe try to, in a very succinct fashion, answer that question, why does it matter? And what are some of the ways in which the history of contemporary Chinese fiction has transmuted and transformed over the course of the last several decades? Yeah, as you mentioned just now, um, the, uh, the book was published um, late last year. It was actually based upon a lecture series that I gave two years ago at Brandeis University. So based upon the lecture series, I developed um, uh, a kind of full-fledged um, approach to the subject of contemporary Chinese fiction. The main point for me is that fiction or narrative fiction constitutes one of the most important um, cultural and political uh, institutions throughout the modern times. In 1902, when Liang Qichao, one of the forerunners of um, uh, Chinese um, reform or even Chinese revolution at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, China uh, fiction was promoted as one of the most important of weapons to help reform the status quo of China. Then as late as uh, 2013, um, President Xi Jinping of the PRC came forward to encourage uh, Chinese, the Chinese people in general, to tell as uh, many good stories about China of, or of China as possible. So tell the good China stories um, became a national campaign um, ever since then, uh, the past seven or eight years have seen a, um, a, a parade of um, movements, campaigns and uh, all sorts of um, PR things um, uh, happening in the PRC to promote um, fiction or narrative uh, fiction or storytelling as one of the ways to, uh, to help reform China. So I see the um, mysterious uh, linkage between the two ends of the more than 110 years of history of a modern Chinese narrative fiction. And um, I came to, um, to feel the power of a fiction as something not merely confined to the, um, to the uh, field of a literature or culture, uh, cultural dynamics, but also um, basically fiction uh, at least in the modern Chinese tradition, has to be taken um, seriously as one of the political protocols to uh, facilitate um, mass communication. So that's one of the uh, major motivations for me to, um, to take up the subject matter. And along the line, um, of course, I have read um, uh, quite a number of uh, fiction, um, not only uh, from the PRC, but also um, um, fiction produced in various um, uh, Sinophone communities. And I came to realize that um, really uh, storytelling um, to uh, put the um, fiction in the, uh, the quintessential form of, uh, of narrative storytelling certainly is uh, one of the most important ways for us to imagine um, what kind of a China we are living in and what kind of a China we are looking forward to. And also to intervene with the, uh, the circumstances we are undergoing either um, within China or without China. You know, you mentioned uh, Liang Qichao at one end and Xi Jinping on the other. Right in the middle, of course, for me, when I teach modern Chinese literature, one of the most important voices in terms of defining what literature is and what is the role of literature in society was 1942 Mao Zedong's Yan'an Talks on Art and Literature, where basically he laid out this prescriptive formula of what 
literature's role in society should be, who it should be targeted towards, what are the no-nos in terms of the red zones mm -hmm. where you shouldn't touch. Uh, and I think it's hard for maybe some of our maybe international audiences who are not familiar with Chinese fiction and Chinese literary history to really appreciate the impact that document mm -hmm. had over the next many, many decades. Right. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the long standing impact of Mao's talks and going forward, how that's impacted the entire trajectory, not just of literature, but all of cultural production up until this day. Yeah. Um, before I answer your question about Mao's role um, in uh, formulating this, um, this whole program of promoting uh, one specific type of a prescriptive form of Chinese fiction, maybe I should say something about fiction as such vis-a-vis uh, -vis the tradition of Chinese culture at large. That is, um, traditionally, a narrative fiction was um, um, not treated as a uh, prestigious genre. Um, poetry was always um, uh, celebrated as the quintessential uh, form or the quintessential genre in, uh, in pre-modern Chinese literature. So in 1902, when Liang Qichao came forward to promote fiction as the only way to help reform the Chinese soul, the Chinese mind, uh, Liang Qichao's um, uh, agenda was nothing less than a, um, a uh, revolutionary intervention with the past. So um, for our audience um, who, um, who are not familiar with the tradition of either pre-modern or modern Chinese um, uh, cultural dynamics, um, um, probably I wanted to say that fiction played a role uh, which is directly, directly related to the pedagogical agenda uh, and the political agenda of uh, modernizing China. It is in that context when in 1942, Chairman Mao um, in his uh, three Yang'an talks pointed out the uh, necessity of, um, of a promoting literature as one way of reforming and revolutionizing China. Uh, I, I think truly, um, in a way, Mao Zedong was, um, um, was continuing the unfinished project of um, literature and the national reform uh, launched by the generation of Liang Qichao at the beginning of the 20th century. In the meantime, as you pointed out, that um, Mao certainly was a far more uh, prescriptive, far more mandatory, and a far more imposing when he um, asked his followers to treat literature very, very seriously, right? And to treat particularly the, uh, the folkloric tradition of Chinese literature very seriously. So in a way, um, he probably was, um, was further radicalizing the agenda first conceived of and promoted by Liang Qichao. Um, that is uh, to really disseminate the power of literature among the general audience, who by the um, uh, early 1940s were still largely illiterate, still largely peasants. For literature, for Chairman Mao, uh, has to be understood as a, um, a vernacular form of literature, has to be understood as a very folksy um, representation of Chinese lives as such. Right? But on the other hand, I wanted to say that Liang Qichao and Mao Zedong were either wittingly or unwittingly continuing the good old Confucian tradition. That is um, a culture and the literature, all right, um, still constitute the uh, major form of uh, education and the communication to facilitate a great uh, national project, modern or pre-modern, whatever kind of ideologies and so on and so forth, um, still culture and in our context, the crystallized form of culture, literature as such has to be upheld as the major power of, um, of our promotion. So Chairman Mao in that sense uh, sounds like a very harsh and a radical version of a Confucian scholar, right? And if ever since 1940s, even I would say even to date, when President Xi Jinping um, wanted us to tell the good China stories, you could still sense this, uh, the haunting impact of uh, Confucian, uh, a kind of um, sort of a didactic kind of uh, intent 
just now turned into more formulaic and more propagandist um, on behalf of a certain governmental or political agenda. Yeah, thank you. You know, I'm not sure if you'll agree with this, but I also feel another major difference when we think about Chinese writers in the modern era vis-a-vis -vis their Western counterparts. And this traces back more to the May 4th period, but many of these writers didn't look at themselves as people producing works for leisure and entertainment, but there was a self-conception, people like Lu Xun or Mao Dun, uh, they, I, I always feel that they, there was a self-conception, they were almost like cultural superheroes. They were there not just to entertain you, but to save you, to save your soul, to save China. And I'm wondering if you could also say a little bit about that thrust and how historically that has, is it still there? Um, is there still remnants yeah. of that today in China among writers um, or is it completely dead? Okay, uh, I, I think I will give a very paradoxical answer. Uh, yes and no, all right. Um, to begin with, um, for our audience um, who are not familiar with the May 4th movement, um, I think uh, Michael and I were talking about um, the, uh, the, uh, the massive uh, campaign for national rejuvenation that broke out in 1919 in response to um, one of the recent setbacks that China underwent um, after the First World War. And um, during that period, the Chinese students and the so-called um, inspired uh, and, um, and, um, and, and the progressive uh, intellectuals and the cultural workers um, all came up to um, uh, promote a new form of, um, of culture, a new form of culture in terms of literature in such a way as to, um, to re-educate the Chinese people uh, in terms of the two new modern, um, say, um, programs. One is enlightenment, the other uh, revolution. Um, under that rubric, literature was uh, always taken very, very seriously, uh, as Michael pointed out, by um, scholar writers such as Lu Xun, Mao Dun, and so on and so forth. So even at the very beginning of, um, uh, of modern Chinese literature, uh, fiction was uh, regarded as um, truly as a, both a political um, and um, a pedagogical um, the tool through which uh, Chinese people could be enlightened in such a way as to become a new type of uh, citizens in support of um, um, nation building. So, Professor C.T. Shah, um, uh, my mentor, and, um, and probably um, for, for Michael, the grand mentor, uh, based at Columbia, when we were both at Columbia at, at that time, uh, had a, um, a famous um, uh, terminology, uh, the obsession with China, uh, a kind of um, mentality, or even a kind of political stance. Um, 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 Chinese writers, intellectuals, uh, uh, and I would say even general public uh, would like to, um, uh, to hold up to. And that is um, they wanted to, to, to see everything um, um, in terms of a cultural undertakings. They wanted to see everything uh, and uh, understand and exercise um, all kinds of uh, social institutions and um, um, say uh, formats in relation to the agenda of nation building and the national reform. So back to your question, uh, yes, um, for the first and the second generation um, scholar writers or intellectual writers such as Mao Dun, Lu Xun, so on and so forth, um, fiction is a very, very serious engagement. Um, for those who are with us um, um, thinking of modern Chinese fiction in light uh, of um, 18th or 19th century European fiction, uh, I would say uh, truly there is a very clear uh, uh, demarcation line. Uh, fiction is not just for leisure, not just for, 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 you know, for relaxation or entertainment and so on and so forth. Fiction is related to the two, um, nation building and the fiction and the nation are related to, with each other. Now, the other side of my very paradoxical answer to your question, Michael, that is um, fiction at the same time also is uh, suffering from some kind of um, image problem. That is uh, for Lu Xun and other um, peers um, of uh, the, the intellectual level of creative writers. Um, 
um, fiction could never live up to their expectations. That is, however much they try hard to, um, to encourage readers to read fiction seriously or even engage with uh, fiction writing and the circulation seriously, there is always um, one dimension um, uh, in, um, in modern Chinese popular culture um, through which Chinese readers uh, come to uh, appreciate the fiction as a form of entertainment after all. So um, actually, um, when we were talking about the May Force paradigm of a modern Chinese literature, now we wanted to talk about the, uh, the kind of parallel developments of this genre. On the one hand, very serious engagement with the agenda of um, enlightenment and revolution. And on the other hand, there is a tradition, a, uh, a, a actually very powerful tradition of the so-called the mattering ducks and the butterfly tradition. Um, that is a, a kind of a fictional uh, exercise or a fictional culture still addressing the dimension of entertainment, relaxation, fun and a game and so on and so forth. So how to, uh, to navigate this kind of paradoxical goals of understanding and undertaking fiction always remains to be the challenge to the political leaders and the um, intellectuals and the cultural leaders of modern China. Uh, back to the 1919 period and the 1949 period, even to date, this is a kind of ongoing struggle um, kind of a struggle between the, uh, the governmental authorities who wanted to see fiction as a form of education and the propaganda and the general public who always tend to deviate from the, uh, pre um, the prescriptive formula um, sort of um, mandated the, by the authorities. So that's actually the fun part for our observation of the dynamics of a modern Chinese fiction. Thank you and, and thanks to our audience for entertaining David and I as we took you on this tour uh, to kind of sketch out the landscape a little bit of the Chinese literary scene in the modern era. And I think it is important to understand Yuhua and his contemporaries to have some understanding of May 4th, of the 1942 talks and all of uh, these movements. But we're gonna try to now focus in a little more on Yuhua. And of course, Yuhua, is a product of the post-reform era, right? And so 1978, you have the open door policy, uh, the cultural revolution comes to a close and all of a sudden all of these Western influences start flooding into China. Simultaneous to that, and equally important I think is the rediscovery of traditional Chinese cultural roots, Confucianism, Taoism, uh, Buddhism gets newfound uh, attention. And all of that clashes together into what eventually becomes, you know, this culture fever. And, and you have all kinds of movements across the arts. And in literature, you have a string of movements throughout the 80s. And from the scar literature movement, which was uh, a very visceral depiction of the horrors that occurred during the Cultural Revolution, to the search for roots movement, the reflection movement. And I position Yuhua in the avant-garde, which kind of came right at the tail end of that in the mid eighties. And I'm wondering if you could help us contextualize a little bit the appearance of Yuhua and writers of his generation. Uh, in Yuhua's case, he's born in the early sixties. Uh, he's roughly the same generation as Wang Ani, Mo Yan and Su Tong and all of these kind of giant figures, pillars of contemporary Chinese literature. Um, but could you kind of set the stage a little bit for us about the importance of the appearance of this group of writers mm -hmm. and why they were so important in challenging some of those literary norms that we've been laying out for the last half hour? Because I think that's where a lot of the meaning okay. comes is in their iconoclastic appearance. And so. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a, a large question and I'll try to, um, to answer it um, um, from several angles. First of all, Yu Huang, he was born in 1960 and certainly as Michael pointed out, belongs to uh, the generation of writers who, uh, who all suddenly, I want to emphasize the word, suddenly just appeared on the literary scene of the PRC in the wake of the uh, Great Cultural Revolution. Um, so I think the timing was very important. We, for, for our understanding of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the cultural or literary renaissance in the 1980s China, we have first to understand the, uh, the bigger picture 
of uh, Chinese literature and the culture after 1949. So that was definitely a turning point of uh, modern Chinese literature. Before 1949, uh, literature more or less enjoyed um, uh, some kind of um, sort of um, sort of um, uh, a loop of freedom um, in terms of a thematics, in terms of a formal experimentation, and so forth. But after 1949, at least for 30 years, that means from 49 to 79, for 30 years, literature was uh, under the, the very, very strict, uh, strict scrutiny and the discipline of a governmental forces. Michael mentioned just now that Chairman Mao's uh, talks in, in 1942, the so-called Yang'an talks. The three talks actually um, prescribed the policy of uh, socialist literature. Um, not only prescribe, but also mandate the policy as a kind of a, not only literary engagement, but also a worldview, a kind of a style of life and so on. It's a highly normative, highly regulative, and uh, sometimes a very, very suffocatingly, um, say, oppressive. So from 1949 to 1979, socialist realism was this, the main, main line or main theme of um, Chinese literary exercise. And it, one can imagine literature produced, uh, produced in the first three decades of um, the Republic, mostly celebrating, celebratory in terms of mood, mostly utopian in terms of projecting the uh, incredibly wonderful new China and mostly um, uh, regulatory in terms of uh, using say realism, this kind of mimetic realism as the one of only way of quote unquote, reflecting the reality of China. So very euphoric, um, um, very gung-ho and always um, um, on the other hand, very uptight in terms of the, uh, the, um, the, the style and the, the format um, and the theme of writing and the reading. Now, Yu Hua and his generation. So after 1980s, some Chinese literature was undergoing a kind of a transformation, very gradual, but definitely one could sense the momentum as if after the first three decades um, 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 repression and a very, very tight control over um, the literature and arts in general, Chinese um, writers and artists of the 1980s suddenly felt the, uh, the urge, this impulse to, um, to experiment with a style, with a form in such a way as to transform the, um, the, the prescribed um, formula um, mandated or handed over by the government. So Yu Hua's generation really um, grew up during the tumultuous years of the Great Cultural Revolution. So we can hardly talk about the, the kind of a so-called formative um, experience uh, as we uh, understand it um, in, in the Western context. Um, for many years, uh, Yu Hua never thought he was going to become a novelist. He was actually trained as a kind of grassroots physician, dentist. But please don't misunderstand um, uh, this uh, profession as a dentist for anything noble or, or, or money making, or whatever, in our context. Um, he was a, traded, a, he, he was trained um, as a kind of a very rudimentary sort of country doctor sort of walking from one town to another just to, uh, to, um, to, uh, to treat his patients in the most primitive ways um, during those harsh years. But somehow for this young dentist, um, dentistry is, is not goal of his, uh, his life. He wanted to, to, to write something. He's, uh, he's um, very, very imaginative. He wanted to, to do something new and different. And again, literature at that time I want to say was treated very, very seriously, just as important as, um, as, as medical school, as engineering or whatever. So um, Yu Hua actually had his great ambition. He doesn't want to become a, just merely a dentist or a kind of a cadre um, sort of officer um, um, in, the, in, the, in local areas or anything like that. Instead, he wanted to try his hand as something new and different. And then we come to the 80s, the cultural fever. 
Um, roughly, cultural fever refers to the period from 1982, 83 up to 1989. For six or seven years, uh, um, China really went through a, uh, a literal uh, cultural boom in terms of knowledge, in terms of um, um, artistic experimentation, and in our, in our um, for our concern, of course, a literary exercise. So two movements happened at that time. One is the search, search for root movement. That means uh, writers now are encouraged to, um, to, to look down into the, uh, the roots of the Chinese society to look at the, not only the, the good socialist uh, utopian aspect of reality, but also the dark, um, uh, say, undiscovered aspect of the humanity of the civilization um, in, in a very broad sense. Um, Search for Root movement truly inspired a whole generation of writers to open up the, variety, the, the horizons uh, and, and the vistas uh, of their, uh, their literary uh, experimentation or writing. But then following the um, search for rootment came uh, the so-called avant-garde movement. Even judging by the, 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 the title, avant-garde, you could tell the, the, the radical, the, the non-conformist impulse inherent in the generation of writers. And Ru Hua was definitely the most um, productive, most imaginative, and eventually the most accomplished um, among the group of avant-garde writers who rose up almost at the same time around 1986 and 1987. And Yu Hua is still to date going strong. He remains to be one of the very few um, who were or are upholding this, uh, this uh, very high standard of uh, experimentation and, um, and the nonconformism and of course, above all, a kind of speculative uh, kind of uh, sort of impulse with regard to the reality prescribed by the Chinese government. So in that sense, I think Yu Hua is one of the, uh, the, the, uh, the trend breakers, one of the trendsetters um, in terms of the Chinese literary development. And the, the novel we are discussing, um, Huo Zhe, or To Live, um, represented one of the highest achievements or accomplishments of Yu Hua's career. Like, and it was, when it appeared, it was completely different than his previous work stylistically. Yeah. As, as we talked about around 86, when he burst onto the scene with short stories like On the Road at 18 and 1986. I mean, these were gruesome, disturbing stories filled with dark allegoric layers. Um, and when To Live came out, that was his second full length novel but it marked a major shift in style. I'm wondering if you could talk about that transformation and what do you, where do you put, how do you uh, understand that transformation, such a radical shift in style uh, in this writer's work at that time? Yeah, I, I think this is a great question. I was asking myself uh, yesterday when I was preparing um, uh, our conversation today and I asked myself, um, what happened to Yu Hua? Because, um, when he um, 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 became known among the general audience uh, in China, 1986, 1987, on the road at the age of 18 and so on and so forth, mostly um, one associates Yu Hua with uh, adjectives such as gruesome, weird, Kafkaesque, right? absurd, um, and so on and so forth. And um, to live, which was uh, published in 1993, uh, comes across as um, still this is a cruel novel. I think we we I think this is a novel full of violence um, uh, in whatever sense. But somehow I think you you surely um, are right to point out the uh, the uh, the uh, the sense of a family, the sense of ethical ties, the sense of a history is coming back. If early on um, Yu Hua uh, wrote in such a way as to depoliticize, quote unquote, um, the political context he was living through. Of course, by that we can modify um, by saying that Yu Hua's uh, 
apolitical avant-garde fiction could still be very recalcitrant and very critical with regard to Chinese status quo. But by comparison, we want to say that To Live represented a major breakthrough because he, Yu Hua, seems to be willing to, uh, to, to compromise with the uh, traditional formula of realism. Now he seems to be more willing to introduce uh, to us more historical details. He is willing to tell in a more concrete terms the political situations through which his characters um, went, um, went through, right? So this is um, a, uh, a kind of, um, is this a kind of a compromise for Yu Hua, either with himself, with his readership, or with, um, with authorities, I don't know. But what I do want to highlight here is the fact of the 1989 Tiananmen incident. And this is, was a really one of the major crises of the new republic since 1949. 40 years after um, the socialist rule, Chinese people suddenly all surge up to demand more liberty, more freedom, um, um, particularly more freedom of a speech. So this is the, 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 the kind of a massive movement amounting almost to a kind of, a, kind of quasi uh, revolution. And of course, it, it was an aborted revolutionary uh, 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 undertaking. And uh, during this period, uh, writers such as Yu Hua, they were all part of this tremendous uh, sort of national longing for some kind of a transformation and change. And of course, uh, we know this 1989 students um, demonstration, which developed to become a nationwide um, um, campaign for more democracy and so on and so forth, uh, um, ended up with a military crackdown launched by the government. It was really a kind of aborted kind of a project, a modernity project, uh, if we wanted to, uh, to, to think of the, uh, the twist of the turns of the political dynamics of China from the, the, the May 4th, 1919 movement to 1949, and then to 1989. Certainly, this is a, 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 a drastic and traumatic experience for that generation of the Chinese people. So I wanted to arbitrarily um, use this as a kind of a, kind of um, kind of a physical or or it's a turning point for Yu Hua's career. Before 1989, um, he was critical. He was a nonconformist, uh, nonconformist, but only in a in a in a kind of high broad manner that he um, he he wrote in such a way as to detach himself from the. Uh, the, uh, the, the everyday life from reality. He wanted to, to experiment, experiment with the um, most um, inventive and radical style and the thematics so as to, uh, to, de, to sort of um, so, um, differentiate himself from the rest of the writers who largely are, were still writing in the traditional realist style. Now come to, to live. 1993. After the Tiananmen incident, Yu Hua, just like um, um, his colleagues um, um, in China, went through a very brief moment of hibernation, right? And then all of a sudden, uh, To Live came up and, uh, and really surprised um, uh, his audience in terms of a changed style and a changed um, the thematics. And here we would say Yu Hua's style is much more accessible now. And he's narrating in a really uh, simple and even barren style, uh, if you will, in a traditional Chinese uh, 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 realistic manner, right? And the story, however, is even more heart-wrenching. This time, the story brings up really down to earth, telling us uh, exactly one man's um, ups and downs before 1949, after 1949, or through all the tumultuous years of the, uh, the, four, the first four decades of, uh, of the new republic. So in a way, we want to say Yu Hua seems to uh, reconcile himself with the reality. He wanted to become more, uh, more realistic 
about his own status, about his own writing and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, he seems to become more mature. And, um, but still you can feel this, um, this, um, this angry Yuhua, this anxious Yuhua somewhere, um, somewhere between lines in this new novel, but definitely um, he was ready for a, uh, a different stage of his career. Right. Yeah. Thank you. I, I hope this doesn't come off cynical, but I think there's also perhaps a pragmatic side to this. And what, what I mean by that is, you are certainly a writer brimming with raw talent, imagination, unbridled. At the same time, he wrote an essay way back, I think in the 90s called Autobiography, where he talks about why he became a writer. And the main reason wasn't like Lu Xun to save the soul of the Chinese people. It was because he saw the writers going in and out of the local writers association, which is a government organization which would provide pension and mm -hmm. salary for all writers. And he was so jealous of them having this cushy job and decided, you know, I want some of that. And that's what actually inspired <laughs> the first writing. And To Live, pub published in 1993, actually corresponds to the year of also Deng Xiaoping's Southern Tour, where he encouraged the country to take their economic reform to new heights. And suddenly, uh, these artists and writers had newfound market potential for their works. And, and so one can't help also wonder to what extent someone like Yuhua and other writers of his generation were sensitive to, the, to these macro shifts happening in terms of the economy, in terms of career opportunities. And he realized that this highly sophisticated experimental style of his early work was not going to be enough to launch him into kind of a new sphere of influence in this new era. And, and, I, and I wonder to what extent consciously or unconsciously that may have contributed to this transformation. Yeah, um, it's, it's very interesting um, for me to think of this question, to think about this question. That is, um, indeed, you mentioned the, uh, the system, the Writers Association. For our audience here uh, in the States, uh, uh, probably it's hard to imagine that if you want to publish, the first thing you want to do is not to write well, but to join the local writers association. So you get your ticket right to the club. Um, at least uh, you get uh, some kind of channel through which you can publish your writings. And Yu Huan uh, definitely, uh, he, he belonged to that system, but then he was very skill, uh, skillfully uh, sort of, uh, sort of um, finding, uh, uh, finding uh, some kind of a balance uh, between his uh, personal uh, engagement and the party demand. And um, yeah, but still I want to say that the whole system of a writer's association started to, uh, to, to change, start to, to, to soften up, right? In accommodation um, with the, uh, the changing um, uh, ecology of, um, of, um, of a communication and, um, and, the, uh, and, the, and the cultural industry in China from the 1980s and 1990s. So yes, I think um, 1993, the year when Yu Hua published his novel, the year coincided with the Prime Minister Deng Xiaoping's new policy that is a kind of a limited sort of a form of a marketization of the, the, uh, the, the whole Chinese economics the system. And Yu Hua certainly uh, um, was trying to, uh, to, um, to, to adapt himself to, to the new circumstances. And he wanted to write something uh, more readable and something more accessible, all right? And also the, the form, realism, is basically regarded as a safer mode of writing and communication um, in terms of uh, Chairman Mao's uh, 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 literary policy at large. Realism, um, again, again, was, um, was uh, celebrated as the only way um, for writers to, to grapple with and to communicate um, um, to the audience at large. But on the other hand, I think that Yu Huan, after all, was getting more and more mature, right? And he wanted to be a good storyteller. And obviously the, um, the avant-garde form provided a one good format of storytelling, but he seems to reach a point where he felt that maybe the more traditional form of storytelling turned out to be a much more productive format for him to communicate with his audience. 
So when we read to live, on the one hand, we feel, wow, this is a, a really very down-to-earth kind of a narrative, now, a very heart-wrenching story, everything you wanted. You can even say this is a, this is a tearjerker and so on and so forth. But we need to keep in mind that Yu Hua, um, in his own life and in his career, in his writing, could be very much tongue in cheek, right? He's a, he's a very, very skillful uh, writer. Um, so um, we need to read between lines, right? And in that sense, I think um, he has compromised, but I don't think he compromises that much, right? And now we back we get back to the title of this novel, To Live. Of course, this novel refers to the, the hardship endured by this um, old farmer, Fu Gui, in the novel, but to live. I think even the title um, is very, very intriguing. Isn't this also a, a story about Yu Hua's own decision vis-a-vis -vis the circumstances of early 1990s China to live? So there is something very, very pragmatic, but I also would say that there is something slightly um, um, existential, slightly philosophical, if you will, um, with regard to the, uh, the prospect of China at that time uh, for good and for ill. Yeah. You know, we're almost at the 30 year anniversary of this novel. And in these 30 right. years, the book has been adapted to stage, to film, audiobook. And it's really over the years taken on a place as a fairly widely regarded contemporary classic in contemporary Chinese literature. What, what is it, what are the elements of the novel that you think have allowed it to become a classic and to become so endeared to so many readers across, you know, not just in China, but it's been adopted as a high school textbook in the United States in some schools. It's yeah. the only Chinese work of fiction to be part of this big read program. Uh, it certainly resonated with different audiences all around the world. And I'm just wondering, what do you think it is about the novel that speaks so powerfully? Yeah, I, I think to that, I can even add that this is a, probably the, the bestseller, even among uh, Sinophone uh, communities in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, and so on and so forth. Now. And um, even to date, as I understand it, I actually checked with the, uh, the, 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 the publisher uh, the day before regarding the status of this novel on the market in Taiwan, still uh, to live ranks number one in terms of PRC writers' um, um, visibility or popularity uh, in a market like Taiwan, still to live, definitely the, the, best, um, the best seller. I think basically um, it tells a simple story and a simple story in the sense that it asks a simple but a very grave, and if you will, very profound question to live, right? And um, let's put this way, this is a, for me, in a way, is a kind of a Chinese a socialist version or a, um, of, uh, of the Book of a Job. It, it, it really um, it touched the, upon the fundamental question that is, uh, after we have been ripped off all resources of our existence, what else can we do with the barren existence of our body, our, our, our livelihood? This is a very, very simple uh, question. But I want to say this is a deceptively simple question because this is also a profound question. So a universal question. I think this is a Yuhua's decision. In the avant-garde period, um, he wanted to be as elusive as possible. He wanted to be as uh, uh, obscure and, and ambiguous as possible vis-a-vis -vis the reality in which he, uh, he was inhabiting and, uh, and writing about, actually. But with uh, To Live, I think Liu Hua has become more mature. He's willing to uh, go back to the roots, search for roots, that kind of impulse on the one hand, but on the other hand, I think he's capable of thinking big and thinking of some, some general questions such as to live, right? And uh, so here, uh, somehow this novel could be read as a kind of an allegory, uh, not only in terms of a national allegory, but also an allegory of the human condition writ large. So I thought probably that's one of the reasons for its appeal. For, but of course, for some audience, the, uh, the spectacle of suffering is, uh, is shocking, all right? And I mean, uh, 
rarely have we found a, a Chinese writer um, who was willing to go that far to present us, uh, a, if I could use a word, to, to pre parade to us a, a series of suffering to the extreme. I, I think there is a, some kind of a sort of, um, sort of, um, sort of determination, a kind of an unconditional encounter with the um, unbearable or unthinkable of our life as such, right? And therefore, it really reveals the cruelty and the brutality and the, and, and the contingency of human life on the one hand, but then on the other hand, the perseverance, sometimes it's a probably even irrational kind of perseverance uh, of, uh, of human beings uh, living under those kind of conditions. Uh, so, so I would say there is something universal now in Yu Hua's uh, engagement with this uh, new subject. Yeah. You know, thinking about the novel right now in 2021 and the current political climate in China, I almost feel that it's a novel out of time in the sense it's out of step with the spirit of the times. Because as you, you just mentioned, perseverance, and that's also one of the qualities that Yuhua spoke about wanting to emphasize the, the individual's ability to withstand suffering, to withstand hardship, and still maintain a positive world outlook and to keep going. And, and I think part of it is also this philosophy of life that in order to survive, you do what you need to do, you lower your head, you keep your mouth shut, you stay out of trouble, and you just, you, you hold on, you survive. But right now, that's not the spirit of the time, so to speak. It's, it's not to keep your head low, but it's, I mean, we're dominated by the little pinks and the, the <laughs> nationalists. And, you know, a few years ago, there was a bestseller in China called China, yeah. China. China is uh, unhappy. <laughs> yes. and, and, and these are, and the spirit of books like that, nationalist type books, that we shouldn't lay down and take it anymore. We should stand up, mostly not to Chinese history, but stand up to the world, to imperialist aggression, to inequalities, uh, geopolitical inequalities. Yeah. And, and I'm wondering, how do we reconcile that? And could this, if Yu Hua wrote this book today in 2000, in 2021, would it even pass the censors today, 30 years later? Yeah, is it, I mean, isn't this ironic? I mean, of course, um, uh, when To Live was for, first published, it did go through some trouble um, with, with the censors, but it was uh, allowed to be published because uh, uh, it really points to some kind of hope at the end of the novel, right? But my understanding is that the, uh, the, the, the movie for, for a short while was banned in China, right? At the very beginning, you can Absolutely. sense it, actually, it's still banned. It's the only one. Really? With, huh. It's the only one of Zhang Yimou's entire catalog of works that remains banned to this day. Really? Huh. I, I, I'm not familiar with that part of the history, but you could sense that the government is still a little bit nervous about this type of a writing and this type of films. But the, the question you asked about um, is, is, is about the, uh, the contemporary the markets or contemporary audiences that response to a novel such as To Live um, in 1993, almost 30 years. I probably would give two answers. On the one hand, very cynically, I wanted to say, well, this novel may well serve as a kind of a nice uh, memento, a nice uh, kind of a sort of token for, for our strange and um, say, um, nostalgia consumption, right, uh, for good and for ill. Um, when you are talking about the nostalgia here as a kind of, a, as a kind of a new item of a cultural industry, you want to consume not necessarily only the good old days, but sometimes the bad old days. To live happens to occupy that niche of this kind of a strange nostalgia uh, concocted for whatever reason um, in, in, in post-socialist or post-capitalist China, right? But uh, more seriously, I wanted to say that, however, that is um, if Yu Hua's uh, novel um, unnerves us, touches us, or concerns us, I think it, the bottom line um, has to do with his, um, his think, deep, think, deep thinking of uh, what I would call the necropolitics of China. Um, just very literally to think about how many deaths happened in that novel from the beginning to the end, how much suffering people un, un, went through and so on and so forth. We feel pity, 
we feel we feel fear um, to 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 use um, um, the, uh, the the uh, the 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 terminology of uh, of a tragedy out of the context. But on the other hand, when we are talking about uh, looking at to live thirty years after its publication. We wanted to say that contemporary China is run or ruled um, in terms of a totally different kind of ecological uh, sort of setup. Here, we are talking about the biopolitics. We're talking about um, um, citizens who are all happily living in a condition, uh, depending how you define this word, happy. Um, everything is related, related with each other. Um, um, with a sole purpose to facilitate a harmonious, um, orderly society. So here's to live becomes a really a poignant reminder that truly, literally, we are, we are living in a period in which, quote unquote, to live becomes a, a basic governmental mandate, biopolitics that we, we keep everybody live live in a, in, in, in a, in a manner uh, or with an assumption that we are happy and that we are, we are being taken care of. We are living in a society you know, way beyond um, what those, um, those capitalist societies could have imagined and so on and so forth, um, pandemic free and so on and so forth, everything. So basically, I think the, um, the difference here is that um, we are living in a, uh, a new type of or new format of, of governance, and in which um, the pressures it seems um, seems um, far and away. No. We don't have those kind of a horrible uh, cultural revolution type of stories uh, uh, to think about or to talk about. We were actually even taught to forget about those uh, revolutionary experiences just to live very very uh, cynically, sort of a postmodernist existentialist kind of uh, form um, actually endorsed uh, um, in a very imp implicit manner by the government. By contrast, I think Yu Hua, if, if, if we still feel Yu Hua says that the work is uh, powerful today, I think he is uh, sharing um, a different kind of uh, story with us. It is about the necropolitics. It is about how um, frail, how unpredictable, how uncertain life could be. And the bottom line is to live or to die, actually. So I think there is still the, the, the fundamental difference here. And I agree with you that we are, we are in a totally different um, uh, cultural aura or atmosphere here, if we speak of, um, of the PRC at large. Um, but basically to live, right? But to live now in a, in a totally different uh, sort of uh, context. And that's the irony I could spot that if we are still reading the story of Yu Hua's to live, vis-a-vis -vis -vis the reality of China today to live. Thank you. And I think maybe that's a perfect place to pause this portion of our conversation. I have many more questions I would love to talk to David about, but I'm fortunate because we can continue this conversation next week in part two. Uh, but we do have a lot of audience members that have already posted several questions. And I'm wondering, uh, Sophie, shall we um, start entertaining a few audience questions? Yes, of course. That sounds like a great idea. Would you like to read some of them out, Michael, or I can sure. read some of them too? Well, let's, uh, so the first question is, how do Chinese readers react to the story? Do they recognize that Mao was the one who contributed to all the misery? Huh, this, is, um, this is actually a, a tough question. Uh, my, my immediate answer would be um, Chinese, the Chinese readers are, are harboring a, um, a very ambivalent attitude toward, uh, toward the, the legacy of Mao. So um, they read the stories, um, um, as I said, um, for maybe for nostalgia, for good and for ill. This is a very uh, sort, of, uh, sort of ambiguous and, and ambivalent attitude, right? So that's one part of um, the, the issue. 
Uh, do they recognize that Mao was the, uh, was the one who contributed over the misery? Um, I cannot speak on behalf of the Chinese readers uh, in the PRC. I, my personal answer is that um, the whole legacy of Mao is such, it really uh, has a kind of larger than life scale um, called the sublime or called a grotesque at the same time. It makes it very, very difficult for, 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 for the every man in a Chinese society to, to process that kind of complex feeling regarding uh, Mao and even the whole regime in terms of a historical uh, legacy. So um, I, I think in a way that to live the novel, uh, manage to convey that kind of a complex feeling. So you can hardly find a kind of definitive answer as we wanted to offer um, in a different world. That probably would be the answer for this question. Yeah, I would, I would also add that I think for readers recognition of Mao's role in say the Cultural Revolution and so many of the political movements has a massive amount to do with that reader's family's positioning during that period. And so if that reader came from an intellectual family that was persecuted, chances are they'll have a highly critical stance on Mao. Uh, if they came from the, the three holy classes of workers, peasants, and soldiers, many of them thrived under the Mao regime and tend to have a much more positive and nostalgic view. And so I think these historical perceptions are very much tied to individuals and familial placement in terms of that, that those historical eras. Yeah, on that note, I probably want to say that uh, Mao um, as, a, as, a, as a kind of um, political leader, the image is a seemingly uh, receding toward the, uh, the large so-called memory machine of the PRC. And um, you, you could still see a lot of uh, sort of, uh, sort of uh, traces of, uh, of the Mao time and so on as a part of the, uh, the national uh, sort of campaign uh, for, for remembering um, uh, Chinese history the proper way, right? But basically it's now a rather sort of monumental but a vague kind of, a, kind of image, right? As still um, some haunting somewhere or looming somewhere. But in recent years, um, of course, the, the Mao cult is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a striking back. Even some intellectuals, even intellectuals uh, who might have undergone some hardship uh, during the Cultural Revolutionary years, uh, now um, would probably want to say, well, uh, given what we are enjoying now, uh, uh, economic boom and um, and the very uh, quote unquote a harmonious society, and so we don't want to disturb the uh, the, the social order, and uh, probably um, uh, Mao. Um, hasn't done that badly after all. So there's a lot of a strange uh, sort of um, uh, backs and forth uh, kind of uh, argument about the, uh, the, the memory of a mountain. It's a very complex situation in China. Yeah. Definitely. I, I'm going to add one more thing to further complicate it, which uh -huh. is for a long time, several years ago, I actually gave a lecture on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the Cultural Revolution. Uh -huh. I gave a talk about the absence of Mao in these narratives, because of course you can't blame Mao for the Cultural Revolution. Instead, it's politically correct to blame the Gang of Four or these other mm -hmm. historical forces, but Mao is always protected there. And basically what I argued there and what, what, what I'll just put forth here is to what extent the absence of Mao, uh, the, for the, the erasure of Mao's role in these historical tragedies is actually one of the primary forces shaping all of the literary movements of the 80s about the Cultural Revolution. So we think of avant-garde uh, and Yuhua's weird experimentations with language. You think of the Menglong poems, the misty poets who are using allegory and misty language to portray mm -hmm. their reality. Uh, search for roots, right? This, this deep probing of the what's wrong with the cultural Chinese cultural tradition to bring us to this place in history. And I think a huge amount of that discourse all plays out in the shadow of yeah. the fact that you cannot name that which must be named. It would be like writing Holocaust literature mm -hmm. without being able to mention Hitler. It's, yeah. uh, and so I don't think we should underestimate the extent to which the entire literary history of 
you know, from late 70s onward has been mutated unnaturally by these political imperatives of not to mention Mao and not to mention certain politically sensitive keywords. Absolutely, I agree with you. I mean, I mean, this is a very, very, um, how to put it, really very intriguing ecology. That probably the only term I could use here, um, the uh, the presence and um, uh, or even omnipresence of Mao and the absence of Mao at the same time, right? And I wanted to introduce uh, one terminology that is a Mao discourse, right? Um, the, the, a, a kind of a discourse that uh, in a way substantiate, I don't think it's an exaggeration, substantiate the way, the way we live and we think the quote unquote reality of, um, of, uh, of the Republic, of the Re people, People's Republic, even to date, right? And uh, so I, I think the question is, Mao is, a, is, a, is an icon. Right? Talking about iconography, um, you need something. Uh, talking about pol political theology, you, you need a kind of godlike figure to help back up the rationale of, um, of everything, even in terms of uh, everyday life of practice uh, to the, uh, the governmental uh, so legitimacy. And then, as you pointed out, Michael, Mao is nowhere to be seen. Um, people try not to really articulate, articulate this hounding power of Mao. And Yu Hua, I think, managed um, to show us that this is what literature can do to both reveal and hide at the same time by telling a story um, through not telling a story about Mao. So I, I think that, that constitutes a part of the hunting power of, uh, of to live, right? And um, here we have, uh, on, on, uh, in the frown, we have an, an old um, a peasant telling us the sad story he went through, but the unnameable, the unspeakable, the unthinkable will be that person. We don't want to name the name, right? So there is a, there is a tension in terms of Yu Hua's uh, very skillful uh, sort of manipulation of his, uh, his, uh, his, um, his ability as a storyteller, as a writer. Yeah. Sophie, do you wanna do us the honor of choosing the next question? Sure thing. So um, it looks like someone has a question and it says, how would it be heuristic to reevaluate Yu Hua and his somewhat allegorical writing of China retrospectively now as compared to about three, dec three decades ago when uh, To Live was first published? And how would Yu Hua as a writer contribute to the Chinese modern language apart from the thematic aspects of the novel? Thank you. I think the first part has been covered in my previous conversation with Michael. Um, 30 years have passed since the first publication of the novel. And now uh, looking back, I personally still thinking highly, I'm still thinking highly of this novel uh, in terms of my own way of um, uh, opposing um, uh, the so-called necropolitics uh, to um, the, the biopolitics, uh, which seems to be the, uh, the, the policy of China um, right now. Uh, the second part of the question is a highly significant. I think Yu Hua um, is, uh, is a great, um, uh, is a great uh, stylist. I mean, he, on surface, um, he seems to be writing something very simple, very straightforward. It's even very barren sometimes, uh, um, but that's a, a style. It's not just that Yu Hua sits, uh, who sits down and writes it all like that. Um, he has uh, talked about uh, how he uh, sort of uh, created a kind of uh, unique style uh, for his own writing, primarily referring to, uh, uh, to Ernest Hemingway, to, uh, to Kafka, and uh, strangely to, uh, uh, to Kawabata Yasunari. So, um, so different kind of uh, sort of um, uh, uh, international resources that actually contributed to the making of Yu Hua's own style. The style matters because, uh, as I said just now, Mao discourse um, dominated the, the Chinese life uh, at large and also dominated, of course, uh, the way we write about China, uh, at least uh, in the literature department. 
So um, uh, if you happen to have a chance to read the PRC fiction of the first three decades, you could immediately sense what this Mao discourse means, uh, the, the very specific kind of a, even grammatic or semantic structure um, uh, uh, underlining any kind of um, subject you are, you are dealing with. Yu Hua in the 80s uh, as an avant-garde writer um, really disturbed the, uh, the, this, this kind of uh, linguistic sort of an order um, once uh, prospering uh, in Chinese literary circles. And that's his contribution. I mean, just in strictly uh, in linguistic sense, I think Yu Hua definitely uh, made his experiment and had a breakthrough. Um, one probably couldn't tell that kind of uh, innovation that clearly in a novel such as To Live, as we talked about early on, uh, Yu Hua uh, was much more compromising in terms of his uh, linguistic style. But still, I think the, um, the, uh, the style uh, is something uh, we want to uh, look into, but probably uh, in the interest of time, I should stop my answer here right now. Well, we have time for, for one more question. And it's a, it's a question about um, the, the translation process. So this is, this is maybe more directed um, for Michael. So they're curious about what that translation process was like for you, but, but someone specifically asked, given the size and diversity of the contemporary Chinese fiction market, how much is deciding to translate to live into the English speaking market and for example, feature it as part of this initiative, this big read project, a reflection on an American obsession with China um, that thinks all cultural production is in fact part of a century of historical reconciliation with wave after wave of traumatic events. Thank you for the question. Uh, indeed, there, there's, there is a skewed representation of what we see in Chinese fiction in translation in English compared to what you see if you look at the overall market of Chinese literature in China, in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, and other Chinese speaking territories. Without question, there is a lag there. And especially in the United States for a long period of time, I would say from the 80s all the way up until the early 2000s, especially, it became almost there would be a tagline, you know, banned in China on so many of these so-called controversial novels that fetishized, you know, the Cultural Revolution and June 4th and various moments of suffering in modern Chinese history. And it's a difficult quandary to navigate because on the one hand, many of those stories cannot be told in China. And these are the only spaces, uh, these international public publishing spaces where those stories can be told. At the same time, you do run the risk then of presenting a skewed vision of what Chinese history and culture is. And so I, I'm a big proponent of having more diversity of voices. I think we need more Chinese entertainment literature and sci-fi and youth literature and graphic novels. And we really need a kind of healthy cross-section of literary voices that represent uh, the truly remarkable accomplishments that so many Chinese writers have made. Unfortunately, we don't have that at the moment. And part of that is because the market is so small and so selective. Uh, in terms of my personal uh, decisions to, that went into choosing to live. It was the first novel I translated, you know, as I mentioned in the beginning, 25 years ago. So I was an undergraduate in college when I read it. I was, uh, and I'll talk about this during part two of our series, um, but it came down to something very, very simple for me at that point in my life. And that's, I fell in love with this book. It was the kind of, I read it in one night, it grabbed me, it enticed me, it, uh, I even gave up oral presentation on the book in my Chinese language course as an undergraduate. And uh, I think I analyzed the book according to an existential and Buddhist reading. And I gave these two kind of complementary readings to the book, you know, as a idealistic youth. Um, but it grabbed me. It made me kind of really fall in love with the story, with the narrative. And certainly at that age, I wasn't thinking of uh, these bigger issues of how this novel could shape Western perceptions of China or uh, these kind of more philosophical questions. It was really came down to the fact that whenever you translate a novel, you need to have a deep emotional attachment to that work because in some cases you'll spend years of your life 
living with that narrative. And even after it's finished, it becomes kind of a <coughs> So that's always been my primary, uh, the, the primary thrust that makes me, uh, leads me to a work is having that deep emotional uh, connection. And so that's what led me to, to the book. I'm not sure the criteria for the Big Read program in terms of selecting the book, but I think it had a lot to do with the fact that it has won so many awards. It's sold very well. It's had just such an impact internationally. And also the book, besides being a great story, it's a microcosm of modern Chinese history. And so you get a snapshot of the Sino-Japanese War through liberation, the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, all the way up into the early reform era. And although it's not a history textbook, it complements historical texts in a way by giving it a human voice and putting a human identity to that history. And so I think it makes that period of history much more accessible to average readers than um, a lot of other similarly uh, other other literary works with the same historical backdrop. And so I think that's one of the reasons that it's maybe appealed to so many people. Well, thank you both so much. We have many, many more questions which were asked, but unfortunately we are just out of time today. So um, maybe we'll actually get to answer some of them. Uh, if people attend our program next Monday, um, Monday, March 16th, it's going to be co-presented by China Institute. And if you haven't signed up, this is to our audience, if you haven't signed up for um, our other programs yet, please do so. Uh, the link is on our website, uh, www.eldridgestreet.org. We have a book reading bilingual in English and in Mandarin Chinese this Wednesday. Um, and then there's also going to be a film screening next week um, following part two of this discussion. So Michael and David, thank you so much. Um, such an honor to have you here with us at the museum at Eldridge Street, and um, we'll see you very soon. Thank you. Thank so you. Thank, thank you, you very much, so much, Sophie, and everybody. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.